Welcome to our fourth edition of Data Day. And uh, as it was pointed out last year, March 29th is a very auspicious day, not only because of Data Day, but also because it's International Smoke and Mirrors Day. <laughs> Thank you, Marcellus, for that. And of course, uh, for those who hail back to uh, UK origins, it's Brexit Day. <laughs> I would like to introduce uh, our President, Rosanna Riley runter to uh, open the, uh, the proceedings and welcome you to Carlton. Rosanne? Thank you very much, John, and welcome to every one of you. Look out at that beautiful river and imagine it sparkling in the sunshine. <laughs> um, day to day. Um, John gave me lots of numbers that I could tell you. Um, that there are 300 of you here and how many posters and how many students, it's extraordinary. And numbers are really important. One of the first references that I saw to numbers uh, is back in the 16th century, uh, uh, a physician named Brown wrote about the magic of numbers and how he thought that numbers um, were the key to science. And if you could understand numbers, you could understand science. Um, went on into the 18th century. I know some of you are wondering, what am I doing back in the 16th century, now the 18th century? Uh, John, no, you don't remember that. <laughs> that's, that's a fake memory. <laughs> um, so <laughs> so uh, back in the 18th century, can you imagine you know, they, they, they perceived of the universe as, as going around the, the earth, at, you know, the earth being the center. And suddenly they discover it's not actually not true. And then they get microscopes and they discover a whole universe of cells and things that they never expected on the inside of every um, person, of every, of every uh, tree, of every being. And they couldn't make sense of it. And the worry of that was, is there sense to life? Uh, in the early 20th century, the existentialist philosophers said that is in indeed the problem of, of life. How do we make sense of life? We're surrounded by signs, by figures, by symbols, and we don't understand them. And we can only interpret them poorly through the lenses we're given. And today, we have big data. And we saw it coming. We said we need more information in order to make good decisions. And then when we got information, we said, oh my goodness, there's so much information we can't decide. And it is a problem. And it is not just a problem for uh, organizing our machines, and it's not just a problem for philosophers. It's a problem that affects every single individual, every machine we develop, every organization that we run, our governments, even our own personal lives. We have information around us and how do we um, manage it? A number of years ago, we said it was access to information which was going to develop and make nations powerful. And those that didn't have access to information would be those that failed. Um, then it was how fast do we have access to information? And can we get access to all information? And now it is that information, how do we create a hierarchy of knowledge? How do we access and sort out the knowledge that's important to help us make good decisions? How do we do it mechanically? How do we do it mentally? How do we organize our lives? This is an extraordinary time. It's a time when we have the power, not just to ask what is the meaning of the universe, but to organize the information so that we can figure out the meaning of our own lives and why we are doing what we're doing. This is an extraordinarily exciting time. And I am so proud that Carleton University started some years ago with John Absimon and Malcolm Butler, uh, this program in data analysis and data management. This is really important. It's important for today. It's important for tomorrow. It's important for Canada and the world. So please join me in thanking them. And 
Let's congratulate all of you for getting up early in the morning, even though it was a cloudy day. And let's especially congratulate our graduates who are have uh, put posters out there showing their extraordinary work. And let's congratulate the fortunate companies that are going to hire them and benefit from their great wisdom. Thank you. What a great segue. So uh, Roseanne mentioned numbers. Well, there's some interesting ones today. You're over, uh, there are over 300 registrants here. Uh, mixed, interesting enough, so about 100 students. Uh, over 50 uh, industry representatives, over 50 government representatives, uh, 30 or 40 faculty members, and then a strange group called Other. <laughs> you, you, you never identified yourself, so you're either spies or you really can't identify yourself. But you, hmm? Standard. That was not one of the listed categories. Oh, okay. <laughs> normal. <laughs> There's no normal people here. <laughs> But one of the exciting things about today is the, the number of people who want to sponsor this, this day. That's an indication, I think, of its, uh, the importance and the potential. We have 14 uh, sponsors. You'll see their names flashing up from time to time, and I particularly want to thank them. Their support enables us to, to run the event and also to provide some valuable prizes to our poster to, uh, competition. Uh, there will be, please, Feel free to walk around the posters. There is a panel of judges whom I'll announce later who will be making a decision and we will announce that the, 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 this afternoon. It's uh, an important uh, time now for the Institute of Data Science. That was announced at this, at this podium uh, two years ago. It had been going for a year, then we announced it. Uh, it was on, at that time it was on April 1st, but it wasn't an April Fool. It was actually a successful operation. There are presently 80 students, that's two cohorts of 40 each in our Institute for Data Science Collaborative Masters. Most of them are here today, and I hope those of you who are from off the university get to meet some of our students because they're a very special breed. And uh, there is later on today, as you know, a speed, I call speed dating, but some of the staff don't like that. I'm too old for that, so speed networking. Uh, where, where a number of our, uh, our sponsors will be at those little, these little mushroom tables later in the day, will be, will be uh, meeting with anybody from student body who likes to meet them in a, in a very short, uh, a very short uh, chat just to see if there's former interest. So with that, um, we'll move on to the day, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to our networking, uh, our, our keynote speaker, that's Robin Grosset. Robin trained as a Scotsman uh, by uh, birth. Uh, I, I'll, I'll talk to him anyway, being a Welshman, I don't mind. We're both same, same uh, Celtic blood, I guess. Uh, studied in the UK, worked with a small uh, startup company which was acquired by Cognos, which you remember used to be up the, up the road, which was then acquired by IBM. So Robin got acquired and acquired and acquired. And then most recently, he's moved to a, a startup here in town called Mindbridge, which is uh, going great guns already in the, uh, in, in the, in the financial uh, fraud area. And actually, a big announcement last week, he would just uh, have done a deal with the Bank of England. So the pound will go up immediately. And Robin, <laughs> it's, it's my pleasure to introduce you. <laughs> so thanks very much for inviting me to, to speak. It's a real, it's a real honor. Um, so this is actually a picture of the Bank of England. Uh, I don't know if anyone recognized it. I sneak it into Slideware now. Um, yeah, so there was an announcement last week that we're, uh, Mindbridge is a part of the Bank of England um, FinTech Accelerator. So uh, we got in the Daily Telegraph in the UK for that, which was it's quite a big deal for a small startup. Yeah, I have a slide about me, so I won't, I won't actually spend any time on this. The thing you need to know about me is I was a physicist, and I got distracted by computing science. Um, I became an engineer. Um, I was a part of IBM. Some of my colleagues from IBM are, are, are here. Um, uh, IBM Distinguished Engineer. I worked on, uh, in the Watson Group, I was a part of, um, I was Chief Architect for Watson Analytics. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about you know, things that I'm kind of quite passionate about from a data anal analytics standpoint. Um, and it's, uh, it's been my, my life, if you like, analyzing data. I actually, my first job out of school, 
uh, was in a, something called a business intelligence startup, and it was all about analyzing data about how businesses operate. Um, uh, and you know, I've, I've been doing that now for something like 22 years, quite a long time. Um, but there's a lot of change happening right now. Um, someone mentioned earlier, it's an extraordinary time right now. And it actually really is. Uh, and I want to give you this kind of overview of what I see is happening um, and the connection between data science, machine learning, artificial intelligence, how these things will shape all of our futures. Um, I, I promise not to plug MindBridge too much. Um, I actually try to make the presentations I do not about MindBridge. Um, but there's an example I want to share with you about it, because it's, it's very relevant to the story that I want to tell. So uh, I'm going to talk about how data is driving change, um, how we can cope with the increasing volumes of data and the increasing demands on data. There is hope. Yeah. Um, and I'll give you the example I've chosen is MindBridge. Sorry for that. I, you know, it was a good one. Um, so nearly 70% of CEOs believe that data and analytics will generate the greatest return on, on uh, their, their stakeholder value. This basically means make, make the most money for them. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that, uh, and again, this is the uh, uh, CEO of Bank of America, uh, technology is going to lead to a sea changes in how companies will be organized. Uh, and it all revolves around using big data and, and an analytics to make decisions. Um, so these are the statistics. Everybody knows this is, this is a good idea. And he here's an even bolder statement. It's the end of tech companies. You know, I read this headline and thought, oh, oh, that's really bad. I'm in a tech company. Um, it's the end of tech companies. Um, what they actually mean is um, it's the end of us actually calling out that a, a company is a tech company. It no longer makes sense to have that differentiation because every company is going to have to be a tech company going forward. Uh, this observation uh, is uh, that the membership of the S&P 500 is changing. Uh, and more and more, they're becoming tech companies who can leverage data and analytics to their advantage. The five largest companies today uh, by market cap in the S&P 500 are Apple, Alphabet, Microsoft, Facebook, and Amazon. So think about that for a second. They're all, we think of them as tech companies. One of them was a bookseller, you know, but they're all tech companies. So this idea that, that unless you're doing this, you're in trouble. And there's good evidence that supports this, that if you're, if you're not doing this, you're losing your, your competitive advantage. Um, I like this quote about, you know, if you're not into software and tech, uh, you, it's like competing without electricity. Yeah, um, I have another quote about electricity. Everybody seems to think electricity is important um, to data and analytics. So here's an example. Um, there, this is a, from a conference proceeding. This is actually, uh, uh, I, uh, this was uh, work done, I believe, with IBM. Um, Optimizing debt collection. So this is the New York State Department, taxation, uh, Department of Taxation and Finance. And they used a machine learning technique called uh, constraint reinforcement learning in order to understand uh, the people that they were collecting uh, taxes from in order to maximize their time. It was all about making better use of their resources. Yeah? Uh, and in the space of one year, they managed to increase their revenue by 8%. This is a kind of typical number, by the way. If you do analytics, you'll get, you know, 8%, usually you get more actually. I'm used to kind of 30% numbers for this. Um, $83 million increase in revenue uh, for the state of New York as a result of this. And they didn't stop there. This was the first uh, attempt that they had at using analytics to understand uh, how to optimize their work. Um, they actually went on and they did several more iterations in different departments and they continued to see a return on investment. The amount of money they invested in analytics paid itself back by about 100 fold. So it's, it's huge. Uh, here's another example, um, and what I'm, what I'm building here are just the different cases. Why, why do people believe in analytics so much? Uh, this is a, a common problem. If you're a, a cell phone provider, uh, the way you make money is by keeping customers for a long period of time. You don't make money, well, you don't make as much money if they keep churning. Um, so this is one uh, wireless provider uh, using customer segmentation analysis. It's a, it's a machine learning technique. It's typically unsupervised learning technique. Was able to improve their profit by 115%. That's a huge amount. Yeah, uh, the increase from a single marketing campaign just by knowing who was going to churn, how to connect with them, what to say to keep them. Uh, 28 million from a single campaign. It's, these, are, these are huge numbers. Yeah? And again, return on investment is, is, is vast. So this is why businesses, if you're not doing this, 
you're competing against people who are doing this, you're not going to win. Yeah? It's really important for a company's competitive advantage. So th th there's something else going on. These are all great techniques. Um, and they're, they're proven to have uh, a return. Um, the, there's an issue, though, that we're collecting data faster than we ever have before. This has always been the case, by the way. I could have a, a slide that said this for about 20 years. Uh, and I wouldn't have to change the chart. You see I have no timeline access there. It just says time. Uh, this has always been the case. Uh, I, I think I remember, you know, we're drowning in data, you know, 1996 was the first slide I saw which had that. It's always been the case. And luckily, we've been able to keep up. Well, kind of. We're not good at this still. Analytics is not broadly adopted as much as it could be. Um, but we've been able to keep up because of technology advancements. Um, but it, it's getting to a point where we might not be able to going forward. 90% uh, of the world's data was created in the last two years. That's a really kind of, it's a scary stat, the, the amount of uh, data that we're collecting. And this comes from things like IoT sensors, um, all of the telemetry that we put in our lives today, our phones, you know, you can connect your dishwasher now to the internet. Um, but leveraging all the data that's being generated, it's still a problem. We, we, it's still a problem daily. Um, and the people who can, who can typically solve this problem, people who can surf the big data tsunami, they're known as data scientists. Um, but it's not a panacea. Data scientists are actually quite hard to find. Luckily, we probably have a few in this room. Um, but they are uh, they're the intersect of different skills. Um, I said that I'm a physicist who got distracted by computing science. I, I had the uh, mathematical skill before I had the, uh, the programming skill. Um, but this combination of skill sets is actually quite hard to find. Um, you know, I hire data scientists. And I can tell you it's still hard to find people with this mixed skill set. It's, actually, I mean, it's pretty much impossible. Uh, and we talk about them being unicorns because they are very hard to find. Typically, you, you might find people with the technical skills and the scientific skills, but you won't find the domain expertise. So you might have to train them in that. Or, or you might find someone with the domain expertise and maybe a little bit of, of, of computing skill, and you train them in the skill that they're missing. That's quite common that in my experience uh, of, of you know, trying to build a team of data scientists is that you typically have to figure out which one of these skills matters most to you, which two of them matters most to you, and, and, and look for that. Because finding all of them is really hard. Um, so the stats on this are there are three times as many job openings as people to fill them. And 83% of people who are hiring data scientists, this is as of 2016, so last year, said that they were struggling to find people. So human capital is in short supply. Who can do this? So pretty much if, you, if you've studied data scientists, you're likely to get a job. That's good news. Um, uh, the data volumes are increasing, and we're in trouble. We're like, you know, the water is rising. It's, you know, at our neck level. It's been there for a while, but, you know, we're not sure what to do next, yeah? Um, so there's a number of different coping mechanisms, uh, and I, I wanted to highlight data science as being one of them. Um, a lot of people talk about data science and machine learning together. You usually do. There's a slight difference between these. One of them is computing science. The other one is all about modeling data. But I wanted to add artificial intelligence to this list. It's actually a continuum. Yeah. Um, if I'm doing artificial intelligence, I'm almost certainly, if I'm doing it right, by the way, I'm almost certainly using machine learning. That there are there are ways of doing AI without machine learning. The, um, and actually, a lot of the research. For 20 years, the uh, symbolic AI was not machine learning based. It couldn't learn. And that's one of the reasons it, it kind of failed. Um, but if you're doing AI, you're actually doing machine learning. And typically, you're using data science to assess your results. So these three disciplines are, are, are related. Um, and I think one of the growth areas right now is in the, the AI space. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about what's driving that. You might have seen the an announcement yesterday uh, in the Toronto Star about Ontario investing $100 million in artificial intelligence, the government. So it's, it, you know, it's really here, and, and it's happening. Um, and we're living through what people are calling an AI spring. So we call this AI spring because there, are AI, there have been AI winters. Since, uh, since AI first started in sort of 1956, um, there have been this you know, enormous hope, look, we're going to do something with AI, and then you know, there's a trough of disillusionment, and we enter an AI winter. So this has been in a cycle. There's maybe been three or four of these. But we're enjoying an AI spring at the moment. And I want to talk about what were the circumstances that brought us to that, and why this spring is potentially here to stay. Uh, this one's not going to turn into a winter, I hope. Um, and you know, hopefully, it's going to be spring here as well soon. Um, 
So this is a, a quote from Andrew Ang. He's the uh, chief, data, chief scientist at Baidu. Uh, he's a lecturer from Stanford University on machine learning. And he has one of the most successful machine learning uh, uh, programs in the US. Um, artificial intelligence is the new electricity. See, electricity, it's important. Um, uh, and he talks about how almost every uh, sector is going to be impacted. Uh, he can't think of a single industry which AI won't transform. Yeah, That's kind of interesting. Uh, and you'll, you'll see it all the time. You just go and open a, a newspaper or read online. You'll find stories about uh, artificial intelligence changing different industries. Now, the thing that's important about this, this list of different examples is we always thought AI could help us you know, do automate tasks like assembly line or explore space was one of the first that people said, oh, we'll use AI to help us build machines that can explore space. Um, but if you look at these examples, healthcare, uh, AI is coming to help healthcare, the legal profession. These are uh, 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 regulated, highly professional industries. And A AI is starting here, in fact. Uh, uh, the uh, IBM's uh, Watson Oncology System was one of the, 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 the first uh, uh, um, projects in, in the IBM Watson Group to try to help medical physicians to diagnose cancer. Uh, and the interesting thing is that it's coming to professions, yeah, not just you know, automating cars. Um, there is uh, an example of, again, another, uh, another startup from Canada, Ross Intelligence. Uh, they're, they're, they're building an, an AI-based paralegal, which will help lawyers to uh, find uh, relevant uh, uh, case history for, for a, a given legal precedent. So it's, it's a very exciting time. And you see this happening all, all, the, all the time at the moment in publications. Now, what's driven this? Um, so this, the spring started maybe 2012. Uh, we got interested again in AI. 2011, IBM did their Watson Jeopardy uh, uh, showcase, where they showed that a machine could play a, uh, a game show. Um, but one of the kind of seminal moments was DeepMind. Uh, DeepMind, this gentleman here, Demis uh, Hassabis, is uh, the, f the founder of uh, DeepMind. And he has a kind of interesting story. Um, uh, he, again, was a computer scientist. Yeah? He graduated from Cambridge in the UK. He went into the game industry, and he built game AIs for a decade or so. Um, he got really interested in how the human brain worked, and he went back to university. He went to uh, University College London. He did a PhD in neuroscience. Uh, his thesis was in how, how uh, human memory systems work. Um, and he applied that. He, 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 once he uh, got his PhD, he went back and founded DeepMind, a startup. And his objective was to create something called a general intelligence. He wanted to build an AI that could learn by itself new problems. So uh, general intelligence is one of the kind of holy grails in the AI world. Uh, and most people don't even try to do this. But you know, he was very bold. He actually scared quite a lot of people with this, because general intelligence has very bad connotations as well. Um, I won't go into those, but you know, think of Terminator movies. Um, uh, so, uh, the, the, you know, he scared people like Elon Musk, who actually scared him into investing in DeepMind. He was one of the people who, who, who invested in it. Uh, um, so, um, the, the, this is an experiment that they did in DeepMind. They built a system that would play Atari video games. Uh, and they made it, uh, you know, it, it's a cart Atari 2600 is a cartridge video game system. I actually played on one of these when I was a kid. Um, um, so they, they made an AI uh, which could play video games. That's not remarkable in itself, but what they did was they, they, they made a very simple, uh, it's a called a con convolution neural network. They just connected the raw pixels from the display to the network. They gave it a reinforcement function. Its, uh, its optimization is, the, is based on the score. Uh, so that's how it does its kind of back propagation. And the outputs from the neural network are the game controls, left, right, fire. Yeah. So very, very simple. When they start this AI off, it doesn't know anything about the game. It knows, doesn't know the rules, doesn't know how to play, uh, and it starts by getting killed a lot. You know, left gets killed, right gets killed, fire, you know, that worked. Um, so it learns to play the game by itself and just based on these inputs. Uh, so the interesting thing, you take the cartridge out, you, you, you wipe the AI, you plug in another cartridge, you start it off, and it'll learn to play another game. So this is one of the first examples of it's a general intelligence learns by itself to play video games. I thought it's really important to have a video game in every presentation I do. So they got a lot of attention for this. This was a general intelligence. This is, I think, this is what started the AI spring. It's, it's a part of the, uh, a, a, a part of the story. Um, so, on the strength of this, they were acquired by Google. So DeepMind was acquired by Google, uh, 2014 for 400 million dollars. So, 
Um, and one of the things that Google did with this technology is they built one of the biggest AIs ever constructed. Um, it had 2,000 nodes. And what did they do with it? They pointed it at YouTube, yeah, which we were just watching YouTube. They pointed it at YouTube and set it off to find whatever was there, yeah, un unsupervised, go and learn what's in YouTube. And what they discovered after running this for several days, almost a week, uh, and by the way, 2,000 computers for a week in a cloud environment is about uh, $120,000. That's about, you know, that's quite a lot. Um, so they spent $120,000, they ran it for a week, and what they discovered is there are a lot of cats in YouTube. <laughs> there was a cheaper way of finding this out, I think. <laughs> but why does this matter? Why do we care? See, this is the new hope. You see the kitten in the background. Um, why do we care about this? It was the most accurate way of classifying images that was discovered to that point. It, it leapfrogged all previous attempts by quite a, quite a large margin. And they started to apply the same techniques to things like natural language processing, processing human language. Um, so, uh, and again, they, they, they then open sourced another breakthrough, which uh, they named Parsi McParse Face, true, uh, which is actually, it's a part of speech tagger, uh, uh, which learned uh, how to uh, tag parts of speech to say what they were. And the accuracy of the system was on par with someone who had studied grammar uh, at that university level. So they've been able to make a natural language parser now using this technique, which is as good as a human being. So it's very impressive. Now, impressive in a number of ways. It's actually enabled by the fact that we have cloud, cloud scale compute. We can point massive, uh, vast amounts of compute power at, at you know, whatever data we like, and we can do this. It, obviously, it costs money. Uh, but the cloud is a big enabler of this. Uh, I would say also GPUs is a big enabler of particularly uh, these, these kind of neural nets, the convolution neural networks. Um, and we can quickly train AIs in new domains with this approach if we have access to the right kind of data. Um, and there are, uh, the other thing is that everybody thinks AI is about deep learning now and deep uh, uh, convolution neural nets and uh, uh, I wanted to say that AI is not just that. I, I think this is one of the risks in starting AI winters is we get fanatical about one approach and we forget all the other really good approaches that we've learned. So uh, I'm going to talk about the, the tribes of artificial intelligence. There's lots of activity. It's not all in uh, the space of, uh, of you know, deep learning and uh, image classification. There's lots of other work going on. Um, so uh, here's you know, different tribes, so symbolists. These were the people who built AIs that would uh, they, they would try to codify human knowledge so a human being would understand it and the machine would understand it. The, the problem with these systems was that uh, they couldn't learn by themselves. They required coders. So they kind of, they've fallen a little bit out of fashion. The connectionists uh, are the ones in fashion at the moment. Uh, Jeff Hinton and, and company in Toronto are, are the pioneers in the space. They're known as the Canadian conspiracy, believe it or not. Um, they're the people who believed in uh, neural networks when everybody else was saying, no, that's never going to work. Yeah. And they, yeah, they're kind of, they've been proven right now. Um, and analogizers, evolutionaries, I really like genetic algorithms. They're actually usually quite effective ways of training uh, neural networks even. But th there's a lot of different techniques. The last one I'm going to mention is the tree huggers at the bottom here. Um, so um, why, is, you know, why are we not just using uh, deep learning neural networks? Th there's very good evidence that things like gradient boosted trees are the fastest and most efficient way of classifying data. And there's evidence from Kaggle that uh, an algorithm called XGBoost is today the most effective one. So uh, I wanted to highlight that there are different things in deep learning in this AI space that you can, you can leverage. Um, now, the, the story about MindBridge. Why, you know, okay, why am I here and you know, why, you know, what is MindBridge doing and how are we leveraging these advancements? Uh, so first of all, I want to describe the problem. Um, it is a big data problem, thankfully. Um, um, so the financial loss that happens because of human error or uh, human error or intent. If you intend to cause financial loss, it's usually fraud because you're just taking money. But quite often, people just make mistakes as well. And it happens a lot, a lot more than you might think. Uh, these numbers are really big, $200 billion. Ooh, that's a huge number. Uh, the, the estimated total, that's the amount that we catch. Yeah, so that's the actual how, how much we're finding based on published uh, incidents of things like fraud. Uh, the, the speculation about how much we're not finding is, is enormous. It's $3 trillion. Just to put that number in perspective, that's $500 for every person on the planet every year. Yeah, that's huge. 
So you think, oh, there must be newspaper stories about this because, you know, that's a big number. Um, so how do I get to 200 billion? Just one incident about four weeks ago, um, British Telecom in the UK, I had another UK story, sorry. Um, they, um, they discovered a hole in their revenues. In, in, uh, they have a subsidiary in Italy, and they had been misreporting revenue. And they discovered this uh, many years later. And uh, what they uncovered was a 500 million pound hole in the revenue number. So they had to uh, uh, um, issue a profits warning. And in one day, the stock market uh, 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 dropped uh, for, for British Telecom. 20% of their share value disappeared overnight. Uh, so in one day, they lost $10 billion in value. Yeah. So that $200 billion is, you know, that's just one incident. Uh, largest lawsuit ever against an auditor was, uh, again, about six months ago in Florida, uh, uh, $5.5 uh, so which uh, was settled. And there's, there's reports, again, this, that this watchdog finds deficiencies in one-third of audits in the UK. That number is from two weeks ago. So it's very easy to get to this fact that we're not doing a good job of this problem. Uh, so this is the statistic which is probably the most damning for this space. It's a big data problem. We have too many transactions that are happening. Auditors can't possibly look at everything. And this is causing this 3% this effectiveness at analytics. How, how is that possible? If you think about all of the other stats I gave you about 30%, you 8%, how is 3% effective for analytics in this space? There's a very good reason for this. You know, um, it's because the audit profession is uh, centuries old, in fact. Uh, the, the first auditor was uh, 500 BC, I understand. Um, but the audit profession in, in, in Canada is about 100 years old. Um, and the, uh, the practice that they established, because the established wisdom is that you can't look at every transaction. You can't possibly look at every transaction as a human being. You, you have to sample them. Yeah? You're going to just look at a few of them. And then you're going to analyze those transactions. You're going to determine that they're real, hopefully, and that there's a real person at the end of both ends and money exchanged hands, that sort of thing. And uh, you argue through inductive reasoning that the rest of the transactions are fine. Yeah? Now, here's the news. Uh, irregularities or anomalies are not the normal situation. They're anomalous. They don't happen all the time. It's maybe a 1 in 10,000 transactions that is something that you need to care about. So if you only sample 1% of the ledger, what's the probability of you finding something that's a 1 in a 10,000? It's a very small chance. Yeah? Um, you can calculate that. Um, but it perfectly explains this. Why is, it, why is it so ineffective? It's because we're using sampling. Now, here, here's the news. Why don't we actually make a computer system that can analyze these transactions so we don't rely on sampling? And this was the idea that started MindBridge. So at MindBridge, we use uh, a number of different techniques. So um, we, uh, we use uh, rules-based uh, systems. So this is typically to codify auditing standards. Uh, this is to make sure that we're at least as good as existing rule-based approaches. Um, uh, and these are things that will, will, will catch uh, patterns that are uh, uh, pa patterns which are not a part of the generally accepted accounting practices. But where we really start to differentiate is when we start to apply, apply statistical methods and machine learning to uh, these transactions. And we've actually trained an AI to understand what is a good financial transaction versus a bad one uh, and, and how to identify that and then present it to an auditor. By the way, our customers are not data scientists. They are uh, non-technical professionals. They know their business. They don't know data science. So we spend a lot of time thinking about how do we present a statistical or AI finding to a user so that they will actually understand it. It's a very important part of building AIs is thinking about the interface with the human counterpart. Uh, and uh, certainly at MindBridge, we see AI as not replacing uh, the auditor uh, at all. We see them as augmenting the auditor's ability to find, uh, detect and find these types of problems. So uh, uh, the results. So again, we launched our product in November last year. Um, and you know, as John said, we, we are, you, you'll, you'll find us in the news with Bank of England. Um, here's uh, two examples of different uh, techniques that we use. We actually have lots of these. It's 20. It's a grow growing number, 23 going on more. Um, so two, two examples here. One's flow analysis, and the other is our expert score. So, uh, and you'll see in the background, you'll see the user interface. This is designed to be used by 
uh, non-technical people, auditors that are just looking at the transaction. So you see this part at the top, this is the transaction, this is how we scored it. Here are all the different tests that we've run. Each test uh, can be a, a rule, it can be a statistical test, like say Benford's Law, which will help you detect uh, whether something has been fabricated, uh, a fabricated transaction. Uh, we'll also uh, run all of our kind of machine learning techniques. We actually compare every transaction we get with every other transaction we get. It's very expensive from an algorithmic standpoint. But it allows us to determine uh, what transactions are rare or unusual, you know, those one in 10,000 transactions, uh, and to highlight those to the auditor. Hey, this is a really unusual transaction. These accounts don't interact very often. The, the values are, are, are odd, and it happened at 12, past, 12 minutes past midnight yeah, on a Sunday. Maybe we should look at this one. Yeah. So we, we find these unusual transactions so that auditors can focus their time. And uh, the example here, we, we, we were asked to go to uh, Grant Thornton in um, Toronto, and they kind of challenge us to find uh, what we could in certain uh, uh, sets of books that they had, which they de-identified so we didn't know who they were. Um, and we went for a day. We did five companies in one day with Mindbridge, which if you're an auditor, by the way, you just fell off your chair because five sets of books in one day is unheard of in their world. Um, so we did five sets of books in, in, in one day, and we gave them five things. These are the five things we think you should look at. Yeah? And then about a week later, we got an email from Eric uh, that said, well, by the way, four out of the five of the things that you highlighted were confirmed cases of fraud. Uh, after this, we actually, uh, we together with Grant Thornton went to the Rutgers Accounting uh, Symposium in New Jersey in November, and we presented this because this was, I think, one of the first times that um, you, people have been writing papers about how you could do this, but now we had the real world confirmation that this actually worked. So we're, we're very excited about uh, uh, um, the results that we're getting. We're very excited to be working with organizations like the Bank of England. But again, shows a big data problem, you know, where we, 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 we come up with a human coping mechanism when we actually should have built a machine. Yeah? Uh, and you know, we were, we're very excited at Mindbridge to be kind of changing, change, putting the fun in audit, is what I like to say. Um, 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 uh, <laughs> So key takeaways, uh, data is changing the world around us. Um, and analytics is fueling the competition in the future. Like every company is going to need to do this, which means that we're all going to be busy, is my guess, yeah? uh, be, you know, because data is expanding. Uh, I would say, and maybe this is contentious, that it's no longer enough just to analyze data. We have to apply human-like intelligence now at vast scales. And I think the MindBridge example is a really good example of where if you can take the activity of an auditor and find a way of focusing, uh, focusing an AI on, on, on solving that problem, you, you can make a huge difference to the world. Uh, and I think you know, AI is in all of our futures. I think it's going to be in our dishwashers and things like that. So uh, anyway, thank you very much for uh, uh, spending the time. And uh... we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, please identify yourself. And uh, I, want, I, must, I, must point out, I must point out that next time I get a letter from the CRA, I'll smile. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Uh, my name is Ken Holman. I'm chair of the UBL Standard Technical Committee. And one of the first acronyms I learned in programming, I don't think many students have heard lately, is G-I-G-O. Yeah, I hear, it. I hear people saying it, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> and um, so my question is related to the integrity of the data that feeds your process, because if you have garbage coming in, you'll be making the wrong decisions. Yep. Semantic identification of that information is important for you to identify what it is you're seeing. And I believe standardization plays a role for organizations to represent their information in a standardized way because everyone agrees on the semantics associated with the labels that you're using to represent the information. And yet vendors and their customers are not supporting or jumping onto the standardization bandwagon, which puts a lot of effort on a company like yours to uh, empirically identify information rather than being told by an organization that this is the information. So if you have an auditing company auditing 100 million invoices, if all of those invoices were in a single internationalized standard format, you'd be able to identify the information more readily and they'd have a commitment to identify their information using these standardized semantics. 
how can companies like yours promote the use of standardization for data so that companies become more honest about what they're reporting and make everybody's job easier by using standard formats? So it's a, it's a really good observation. It's a, it's a very good question. Um, so um, we do have this problem. Um, I, I think one of the things that is maybe helping us a little bit uh, uh, in if you think of social media or most sources of data, they're, all, they're, they're actually pretty messy. Um, one thing that's fairly good about the auditing and accounting world is that we, we have had standards in place that generally accepted accounting practices. Um, you know, all of, the, uh, all of the legislation that came from things like Sarbox, uh, CAS 240, they help a bit, but, but you're absolutely right. No two businesses are alike yeah, in the way that they uh, organize their chart of accounts in the way that they uh, operate their business even. Um, I think there is a need for vendors to uh, create their software uh, and their algorithms to cope with uh, vagaries uh, to an extent. I think it would be enormously helpful if uh, there was a standards body for how people store and communicate their uh, finances. And the best you get these days is something called the Giphy hierarchy in Canada, which is a standardized chart of accounts, which is required for tax purposes only. Yeah? So they don't often implement it exactly as the Giphy hierarchy, but it, they all have to map to it at some point. So it makes it a little bit better. Um, I mean, what we're doing at MindBridge to try to promote standards is we're actually approaching vendors of uh, the accounting systems uh, to try to get them to work with us to develop like a common audit format. Um, there, I mean, one of the um, one of the companies we we talked to actually had a, um, one of their fears was that a standard format would allow it allow customers to switch yeah from one product to another. They, they're worried about the churn aspect yeah. yeah? Uh, and they want to kind of lock you in to whatever they've they've sold you, um, and I, I get the commercial understanding of that. And, and I think um, it's very hard for a small company like us to persuade a big company to say, "Hey, can you just do this standardized format for us?" It's very hard, and you know probably we need legislative help or something like that uh, uh, to promote the discussion. Uh, but I think it's needed. I think everybody identifies that it's needed. And it would certainly it would make our job really much, much easier than it is, because we do spend a lot of time figuring out. Uh, we actually do semantic classification of the data you give us as well to try and identify what's in the data. You know, whether, it's, whether it works or, or, or doesn't, our machine will make our, uh, our AI will actually make intelligent decisions about um, um, what data it processes and how, and communicate that. Um, but yeah, it's it's a very hard thing to do. Um, we are we're starting down that path, but you know any help that you know we we can get in doing that would be gratefully received. Well, the uh, since no one else is at a microphone, you have ten, you have ten seconds. Okay. <laughs> the legislative right. hammer is very helpful. It has worked very well in Europe. I'm in speaking in the area of electronic invoicing. Government procurement mandates the use of a particular XML format for invoicing, and hundreds of millions of invoices a day are being created. Canada, the US, are ignoring international standardization in this area of, say, government procurement. And in Europe, private procurement has now exceeds government procurement using the same networks, the same standards. And yet, organizations in the government in Canada and the US are oblivious to this. And if anybody wants to talk more about it, please catch me in the corner. Robin, thank you so much for... Thank you very much. You know, um, Canada is... Uh, there's an old story is, uh, you know, why did the Canadian cross the road? To get to the middle. <laughs> we don't really recognize our, our, our heroes, but we actually have a hero amongst us today. I'd like to have a little shout-out. Uh, probably not many of you are aware, but, you know, when... A long time ago when Ottawa was uh, still uh, not quite just past the lumber camp, uh, high technology, computing, business in that area uh, started up. And one of the heroes of that is with us today, and that's Denny Doyle. I'd like to recognize his presence. Denny, if you uh, put your hand up. He said, Denzel Doyle is over there. And uh, you may have read his book. I don't think he's touting his book, but it's still a good book, Making Technology Happen. So welcome, Denny, and enjoy the day. Good to see you here. I'd like to uh, now move on to the next section, and that is uh, some vignettes of what Carlton researchers are doing in, in this domain. And we have a group who are going to give you 
an overview right across the, uh, the various disciplines. And the chair of that session will be Fred Daffart, who is the uh, Acting Dean of Engineering and Design. Fred, over to you. 